Well, good morning, Hollywood Community Church. Thank you for everyone who's joined us in person and online. Um, so as you come in and as you're watching online, I'm sure the stage looks different. I'm sure we're starting off a little different. Um, I wanted to have a little, uh, a different moment of worship this, mor this morning. I wanted to spend some time in scripture and in prayer. And um, as we worship this morning, as we sing, uh, I really wanted us to just focus on the Lord, let the songs facilitate our worship. And so I'm going to be reading out of Matthew 5 this morning. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Jesus' words. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Not only are we going to spend time praying through these verses and praying over, um, you know, just letting the Lord uh, use these and, and as we meditate over them, we're also going to be singing a song that um, uses this scripture um, as, as the words and, and adds melody to it. So, so let's take a moment of prayer. Let's come before the Lord and, um, and let's just ask him to speak to us this morning. Lord, as we worship this morning, as we come before you, as we ask you to answer our prayers, as we ask you to move in our lives, I pray that we would trust in you, knowing that everything we need in this life will be added to us, as Matthew 6 says when we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So Lord, during this time of worship, I pray you would remind all of us, myself included, that it's not about me, it's not about my talents and abilities, it's not about glorifying the gift that you've given us and the abilities, but it's about glorifying you allowing you to shine through our good works so the world around us would know your love, would know that we are children of you. So as we seek after being kingdom citizens as these verses and as this song proclaims, that we will sing. I pray that Every day we would seek after being the best representative of you. We would be the best kingdom-minded person we can be. It's not about flaunting our abilities, showing off how good we are. It's about being meek, poor in spirit. seeking after justice and mercy. So we trust in you this morning, Lord. 
Lord, facilitate this worship. You lead, lead us this morning. I pray you speak to all of us during this time. I invite you to stand as we sing. If you'd like, feel the need to fill the void with clapping, don't, uh, I would encourage you not to clap. I would encourage you to spend time with the Lord, praying to him, calling out to him, speaking with him. Let these songs minister over you. Let the Lord use these melodies and words to heal your heart, to draw you close to him. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled, they will be filled. For this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven, ask and he will, ask and he will, oh seek first the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven, blessed are the merciful. For they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart. For they, they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers. For they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness for theirs is the kingdom theirs is the kingdom theirs is the kingdom of heaven they will be filled they will be filled this is the kingdom this is the kingdom this is the kingdom of heaven, asking he will, asking he will. Oh, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven. This is the kingdom. Seek first the kingdom, and all will be added. Oh, seek first the kingdom, and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom, and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom, and all will be added. All will be added. Will you seek the Lord this morning? Seek first the kingdom. And all will be added. Seek first the kingdom. And all will be added. Seek first the kingdom. All will be added. All will be added. Seek, seek first the kingdom. And all will be added. Seek first the kingdom. And all will be added. Seek first the kingdom. And all will be added, all will be added, all will be added. Lord, we come before you this morning, we trust in you, 
Church, take this time to pray before the Lord. Seek Him this morning with the things that you've been too afraid to come to Him with. The things that have made you angry and, and confused. Seek first the kingdom in this moment. Seek the Lord in His righteousness. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. All will be added. All will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. Seek first the kingdom and all will be added. All will be added. And you will be filled. You will be filled. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. Ask and he will. Ask and he will. Seek first the kingdom. Cause this is the kingdom. This is the kingdom of heaven. Ask and he will. Ask and he This is the kingdom, this is the kingdom, this is the kingdom of heaven. All will be added. Amen, church. Amen. Lift up a shout of praise to the Lord. Amen. Let him know how much his grace and mercy has been good to you. Let the Lord know how much his kindness his peace and justice has changed your lives. Let the posture of your hearts just be filled with gratitude. Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Can we sing this together? Let's proclaim it. For God so loved the world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in him will live forever Amen, church, amen. Oh, we seek you this morning we trust in you, Lord, in all of your ways. I may not have a choir up here, but you guys sound beautiful. Let's keep proclaiming this together. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there. With open arms, see his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Forever, Lord. The power. Walking in freedom for God so love, God so love the world. Let's praise God, praise God, praise God from whom all blessings flow. 
praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. Let's sing it again. Praise God, yeah, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Oh, praise Him, praise Him, praise Him for the wonders of His love. His one and only Son to save us For God so loved the world that He gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in Him will live forever We'll sing the power one more time. Let me hear your voices. For God so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever. The power of hell is defeated. The power of hell forever. we can take to our neighbors, to our co-workers, to our, the people we have influence with. So let's not only believe that for ourselves, but let that empower us to leave today, to share it with the person at the grocery store, at the person at the restaurant, or waitress, or waiter who serves us today. Let's sing that one more time. Let's, let's keep it in the secret of our heart to share with the world. God has loved us so much. Let's sing it together, that last verse. For God so loved the world that he gave us in one and only Son to save us whoever believes in him will live forever. Bring your failure. Good morning, church. I hope you all are doing well this morning. How pleasant it is when brothers and sisters dwell in unity together. Amen. And this is why we gather together. We need one another to encourage us, to challenge us, to continue to look to Jesus no matter what we go through in life. And just like this song, beautiful song, God so loved the world. In other words, God so loved you despite all your faults, despite all your failures. And through faith in him, you've been made, made, made new. Amen? So uh, if you're new here to Hollywood Community Church, whether in person or online, we want to say welcome to you. And we're glad that you have joined our church family. And we hope that this is a place where you feel like you belong, that you actually matter when you walk into these doors. You're not just a number for us. We care about you because you are made in God's image. You might say, well, what is this church all about? It's simply this, to be the heart and hands of Jesus within our community. And we do it in three ways. We commit 
to grow in our relationship with Jesus Christ. We're connected with one another, with coming to church like we are today. But it's also being connected in small groups or what we call life groups. And it's also being a part of serving one another, leading one another, training one another what it means to live in the Messiah. And lastly, it's having a heart for our community receiving the love from God, receiving the love from the church family, and then saying, God, how can you use me this week to meet the needs of somebody out there where I can point people to your love, the love that the Father has shown me, and living that out, and when God prompts you through his spirit, you walk in obedience to that. And that's who we are. And if you're new here, we'd love to know that you were here. We'd love to reach out to you and say, how can we help you take your next steps in following Jesus Christ? Or maybe your first step is gonna be putting your faith in Jesus Christ. We'd love to have that conversation. So if you're in person, if you look in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a connect card. We'd love to have you fill that out and you can give it to me or one of our volunteers or drop it in our boxes in the back. Or if you're watching online, you can click the link inside of the chat, fill that out. And I'd love to reach out to you this coming week. Here's a few things that are happening at HCC. If you have a prayer request, we wanna be praying for you as your church family. So we would encourage you to text the word prayer to the number on the screen. And again, that goes to one of us here at the church. One of our staff members will receive your prayer request. We will pray for you. You can also turn in a prayer request through the connect card in the seat pocket. You can put it through our email. You can call the church. There's so many different ways that you can give us what's going on in your life so that your church family can pray for you. And every Friday, we send out an emailed prayer list to anybody that's, that wants this prayer list and your church family prays for you. And so if you want that, please text the word pray or prayer to the number on the screen. Secondly, we are in need of some security volunteers. We wanna make sure that every single Sunday that we gather together, that we are as safe as possible because we live in a fallen world. And so if you've ever sat back and said, I would like to be a part of this security team, please text the word security to the number on the screen. Thirdly, I want to challenge you guys to continue to invite. Pastor Brian's been saying the last couple of weeks, don't just, you can invite strangers to hear the gospel absolutely 100%, but pray about whether it's a family member or it's a neighbor or it's a coworker or a friend of yours and invite them because they say 80% of the time you ask somebody to come to church, they do come. So the odds are in our favor to invite. All we have to do is have the courage, say, God, give me the courage to invite this person to church, whether in person or online. Our Easter services, we have a Good Friday service at 12 p.m., and then our Easter Sunday service is at 10.30 a.m. Lastly, we have an awesome, awesome announcement to give. We have an individual that her and her family have decided to become a member of Hollywood Community Church, amen? And it is always an honor for us. You might say, well, Brad, what benefit is there to being a member of Hollywood Community Church? Why is that important? Why do you guys take the time to even have membership? Membership is a partnership between the church, the leaders, the staff, our volunteers, and it's a partnership with anybody who decides to be a part of our church family. And the partnership works this way. We, the leaders and volunteers, are here to help you grow in all areas of your Christian life. And then your responsibility is to be you, to love the church family here, find your gifts and talents to serve God's kingdom, and as we both are playing our part, we both get to see God do an incredible work at Hollywood Community Church. Because so many times people think, all you need is Pastor Brian. We need you. You have gifts and talents. You are a part of the body of Christ. And when we're all playing our part, the Bible says we become mature and healthy and grown up in Jesus Christ. And so becoming a member is we commit one to another from leadership to you as an individual and to your family to help you grow and take all of your next steps in following Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? You with me? So if you're interested in membership, please come find me. But I want to recognize Betsida Reyes, she's not going to come up here. She's not going to stand in front. She's not going to raise her hand. And that's totally fine. But can you guys welcome Betsida Reyes into our Hollywood Community Church family? We are glad to have, to have you as a part of our church family. And we look forward to seeing what God's doing in your life and your daughter's life as well. Betsida, God bless you. At this time, I'd like to invite Anthony Lorette to read our passage of scripture this morning. Good morning, church. 
We'll be reading from Matthew 7, chapter 24 through 27. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the wind blew and, the, and beat on the house. And it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them, will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. Amen. Thank you so much, Anthony. I invite you to stand as we continue in singing songs of praise to the Lord. And as that scripture proclaimed that when the winds came and they blew, that Christ being our firm foundation doesn't allow that house to move or to fall. So we're going to proclaim that as well in this song. Christ is my firm foundation. Oh, the rock on which I stand when everything around me is shaking I've never been more glad That I put my faith in Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful through generations so why would he fail now? He won't. Sing, I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under. Claim that scripture that we just read.
was built on you I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through Oh, the rain came when blue My house was built on you And I'm safe Your heart and lead in love to Lord. 
This morning I was reading Psalm 111, and David said this, I will praise the Lord with my whole heart. So I just wondered, did you praise the Lord with your whole heart today? That doesn't necessarily mean that you're the loudest singer here, but that you with your whole heart, with your whole being, you worship the Lord. He truly, truly, truly is worthy of our praise. Thank you, Jonas. And, and one of the reasons I, I, I like this, I mean, I love the band, and, and uh, obviously I'm probably one of the loudest singers. you notice we put microphones right here. Just because Jonas says everybody's been singing so loud, and we would love to be able to hear that um, on, on the internet through our live service. But we had to make sure and not point the microphones to me, because I'm just a really, really loud singer. And uh, I, I love that. I love worship. And, and, and I don't want you to come and just cross your arms and watch everybody else worship. But I, I trust that worship is a part of your experience as well. Well, I'm glad you're here today. You had a good week? Yes. Well, one of the things that's exciting for me is to stand up and look at all of you and realize that God doesn't just work in our lives on Sunday morning. But God has been working in all of your lives every single day this week. And you might sit back and say, wait a second, Brian, you mean God's been at work in my life? He has. Whether you realize it or not, God's been at work in your life. The Holy Spirit of God lives within you. And so I trust that even during the week, you're sensitive to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God. And you're allowing God to accomplish in you and through you what only he can do. I'm glad you're here today. Take your Bibles, if you have your Bibles with me, and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. So let me ask you as we begin today, what is the best news you have ever received? Think about that for just a second. What's the best news that you've ever received? You might sit back and say, man, Brian, it was when I got word that I got my dream job. There was a job that I just always wanted to do, and, uh, and man, when I got word that I got that job, that was just like a phenomenal day uh, for you. Or maybe it was the day the doctor told you that your biopsy was benign. <laughs> You'd been worried about that 
for a long time and praying about that. And when that phone call came that your biopsy was benign, you'd sit back and say, Brian, that was, that was really, really good news. Or maybe it was the day you found out you were expecting your first child or your second child or your third child or your sixth child, however many children God has given you, or the day you found out that you were expecting your first grandchild, or better yet, your son or your daughter was expecting your first grandchild, or just maybe it was when you heard that McDonald's has brought the McRib sandwich back again. <laughs> and uh, for you, that was just like the best day ever. Well, in today's passage, we read about some really good news. And as a matter of fact, we are told about news in this passage that is better than any news you and I have ever heard or any news that you and I could share. Paul says it this way in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 1. I'm going to read it in the NLT to start, and then we'll come back to the version we use in the ESV. But Paul says this, let me remind you now, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preach to you before. This morning we begin a new sermon series that we simply have titled, Why the Resurrection Matters. For the next seven weeks, we're going to be walking through 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to take a deep dive into this chapter. And in this important theological chapter, Paul explains to the Corinthians why Jesus' resurrection is truly good news. As we begin, let me, though, ask you a personal question. And the question is this, how important is the resurrection of Jesus to you? How important is Jesus' resurrection to you? Recent surveys show that up to 65% of the population of our country believe in the veracity of the resurrection. That was astounding to me. Six out of 10 people that you would meet on the street would tell you that they believe in the veracity of the resurrection. Now, it's interesting that those numbers are going down with newer generation. Only 41% of millennials verses 18 through 34, would say that they believe in the veracity of the resurrection. I say that because many of us here today, and not only here this morning, but watching online, and even people that we would interact with out in our community, many hold to the resurrection as a theological belief. You maybe would even say, Brian, it is a foundational tenet of my faith. And I commend you for that. It should be. But my question this morning is more practical. My question this morning is more personal. You'll notice I didn't ask you whether you believe in the resurrection. My question was how important is the resurrection to you? In other words, does it really matter? Tomorrow morning when you wake up and go to work, does the resurrection matter? When you sit and eat supper with your family, does the resurrection matter? When you're faced with either blessings or burdens, does the resurrection matter? Let me say it this way. Does the resurrection of Jesus make a difference in your life today. Here, here, here's the main point that we want to wrap our minds and hearts around the next six or seven weeks is this. God desires for you and me to experience the power of Jesus' resurrection every day of our lives. God desires for you to experience the power of Jesus' resurrection every day of your life. Let me read this verse before we dive into our passage. Paul said it this way in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. It was a prayer. It was the cry of his heart. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. 
In other words, Paul is saying, I long to experience the resurrection power of Jesus in my life, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection, that I may share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I might obtain or attain the resurrection from the dead. Does the resurrection matter? Would you pray with me today? Father, as we look at your word this morning, I pray that the Holy Spirit of God would be our master teacher. Father, I pray that we wouldn't kind of just turn the dial off or the sound down because we've heard this message before or we feel like we know everything there is to know about the resurrection. I pray this morning that the Holy Spirit of God would make the resurrection real for us. Give us a cry in our heart, like Paul, that we might know that you. Give us a, a desperation, as it were, to know the power of your resurrection. And I pray that that power, which is available for us, would empower us giving us victory in our daily lives, giving us victory over sin, molding us and shaping us into the person or similar to the person of Jesus Christ, and giving us a hope that is far greater than any struggle, any trial, any tribulation that we might go through today. Make the resurrection real to us this morning, as only the Holy Spirit of God can do. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. First Corinthians was written by the Apostle Paul. Corinth was a major city in Asia Minor. It's located today in what would be the present country of Greece. Paul visited Corinth on his second missionary journey. And this letter was written some three or four years after his visit. And in this letter, Paul addresses several questions and even several problems that arose within this local congregation after his visit. And I would remind you that the church of Corinth was very similar to Hollywood Community Church. It was a local body of believers like us. They weren't perfect by any means. And even though we might think we're perfect, we're not perfect either. We have our own problems, both internal, both personal, and corporate as well, and the church of Corinth did as well. And so Paul, in this letter, addresses some of those questions and some of those concerns. For example, in chapter 3, he speaks of divisions within the church. Some were saying, man, you know what? I like Apollos, and others said, well, I like Cephas, and others, I like Paul. And Paul was saying, hold on a second. We're all followers of Jesus Christ. And we shouldn't allow divisions to exist within the church. Chapter 5, he deals with sexual immorality within the church. Chapter 6, he talks about lawsuits among believers, believers suing other believers. In chapter 7, he speaks of marriage, and he gives what might be one of the greatest, uh, other than Ephesians chapter 5, descriptions and details of the problems within marriage than any other passage in Scripture. In chapter 9, he deals with food offered to idols. In chapters 12 and 13, he deals with spiritual gifts. As we come to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul addresses the significance of Jesus' resurrection. And he's actually answering a question. And uh, uh, in Corinth, there was this belief that was known as Gnosticism, and Gnosticism was prevalent during New Testament times, and, and Gnosticism basically, to summarize it, believed this, that anything physical was bad. <laughs> anything spiritual was good, anything physical was bad, and the Gnostics then had a problem with a physical resurrection later on, saying that one day we will be resurrected and we will have a physical body, and they seem to indicate, no, that can't be the case. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the apostle Paul comes through and not only proves, as we will see in the coming weeks, that there will be a physical resurrection, but Paul says very boldly that if there is no physical resurrection, then Jesus didn't rise from the dead. 
And because Jesus rose from the dead, we can believe in a physical resurrection. Here's the point that Paul is making in 1 Corinthians 15. Because Jesus rose from the dead, so we will rise again. And at that moment, as all of us say a hearty amen, right? Because Jesus rose from the dead, we will rise again. So as Paul begins this dialogue, and as I mentioned, we're going to take our time and go through this chapter. As Paul begins this dialogue, he does so by taking a close look at the Corinthians' conversion experience. What did the Corinthians believe about Jesus? And how, maybe better asked, how did they transform their intellectual belief into faith? Because it's one thing to intellectually know. It's another thing to believe. We know that the scriptures say that even the devils believe and tremble. And yet, we're not going to spend all of eternity with the devils. Why? Because they, never had, they haven't transformed their knowledge into faith. How were the Corinthians able to transform their knowledge of the message that Paul had given them into transformational faith that was changing them and molding them into who God wanted them to be. That's what Paul deals with in the first verses that we're looking at today. So we simply have two points, and we'll flesh them out a little bit. But the first thing Paul shows us is this. The good news is announced. So in verse 1, once again, Paul says, No, I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the gospel I preached to you. The term gospel was a common word. It was used in secular Greek literature as well as in biblical literature. You can go through and some of the the ancient secular writers, Plato and Cicero and others, use this word gospel. It was a common word in Paul's day. And it was a word that simply meant good news. So Rather this morning than taking the time myself and trying to show you what this means, I want to show you just a a, a three and a half minute, minute video by the Bible Project that explains the word good news as well as anything I've ever heard. You'll enjoy this. Here's the video. If you know any Christians, or if you happen to be one, you've probably heard the word gospel as a kind of summary of Christian belief, connected to phrases like, God loves you, or Jesus died for your sins. But over time, religious words like gospel can lose their power and meaning by becoming too familiar. So let's take a moment to rediscover what this important word, gospel, meant to the people who wrote the Bible. Gospel translates the Old Testament Hebrew verb, biser, and the noun, besorah. The Greek New Testament equivalent is euangelion, which is a compound word. You means good, and angelion means announcement. All of these words mean good news, but what kind of news? Well, in Hebrew, Beser is what we might call national news or a royal announcement. Like when King David hears a messenger of Beser that his army was victorious in battle, that means he still rules on his throne over the people of Israel. And after David dies, his throne is passed on to Solomon, his son. And when he was inaugurated as king in Jerusalem, a herald spreads the Besorah, that a new ruler is in charge. But after Solomon's death came a bunch of bad news kings whose corruption led their nation into self-destruction. This is why the prophet Isaiah announced the good news that one day the God of Israel would come as the cosmic king to confront all corrupt and violent kingdoms and restore his rule over all nations. And so when Jesus of Nazareth hit the public stage, he continued Isaiah's gospel when he went around announcing the euangelion of God's kingdom. Jesus claimed that God was restoring his reign over his people, Israel, and over all nations, and he was the one bringing it all about. Now, the euangelion about a new king in charge means a new way of life. Jesus said that living in God's kingdom meant following him by putting down the sword and seeking peace through radical forgiveness and generosity, even toward your enemies. His good news required people to make a decision. This is why Jesus took his euangelion to Jerusalem to confront the corrupt and violent kingdoms of his day. 
But he challenged them in a surprising way with the power of God's generous love. As Jesus was being executed by his enemies, he received his crown and was mocked as a fake king. But he displayed true royal authority by forgiving his tormentors. Jesus was the one in charge that day, giving his life for the sins of others. And then, a few days later, everything changed. Jesus rose from the dead as the true king, whose love is stronger than death. He appeared to hundreds of his followers and told them to spread the euangelion, that all authority in heaven on earth now belongs to him. And they did share this good news all over the ancient world. They did it by writing the four accounts of Jesus' life that are the gospel. That is, they tell the story of how Jesus brought God's kingdom, how he lived for others and died for their sins, and then was raised from the dead. Jesus' followers also shared the good news by simply talking about it. This is why Peter and Paul, or Priscilla and Aquila, traveled all around sharing the royal announcement. While it might look like the rulers of our world are in charge and can do whatever they want, the good news is that the crucified and risen Jesus is the true Lord of the world, the real king of all creation. And in Jesus' kingdom, things are different. It's where the real leaders are the servants because the last are first and the first go to the back of the line. It's where the hungry are fed and the homeless are welcome because love is the most powerful reality of God's kingdom. And this good news is not easy to believe. It actually sounds kind of crazy when you first hear it, but something happens when people tell the story of Jesus and start living like he really is the king of the world. That's when this gospel becomes the best news that you've ever heard. Simple, simple way to describe it, but that's the term that Paul uses in this chapter. And, and Paul uses that term to summarize the message that he preached to the Corinthians. And he uses it to summarize the message that we, in turn, must share with others. So I want you to see how, how Paul summarizes this good news in verse 3. So Paul says this, For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received. Notice the words first importance. Paul is clearly stating that what he is about to mention is of the most importance. And it's important that we realize that Paul is not saying that this message was original with him. Paul is not saying, boy, here is something really important that, that, that I've made up or that I've written or that I've designed, and I want you to catch it. He didn't invent it. He didn't design it. He only delivered to others what God had already authored. And you're going to see as Paul goes through this, he talks about all of these things, and he says, according to the Scriptures— According to the scriptures, in other words, the good news that Paul was sharing was the good news that he had received, a good news that was well documented in the Old Testament scriptures. So notice what Paul says, for I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. So the first part of the gospel is this very simply. Jesus died for your sins. Let me say it again. Jesus died for your sins. Would you repeat that with me? But, but let's change the pronoun from your, because I don't want all of you saying that Jesus died just for my sins, which he did. But I want us to realize that he died for all of our sins. So say that with me. Jesus died for my sins. Jesus died for my sins. Say it again. Jesus died for my sins. The theological term that we use to describe that is the word vicarious. Vicarious means to take the place of another. So we say that Jesus vicariously died for our sins. He what? He took our punishment upon himself. He paid what we should have paid. I've, I've told this story before, but it's been a while. When, when my brother and I were in the third grade, I think most of you know that I have an identical twin brother. 
All right, if Bruce was here today, you'd have a hard time uh, distinguishing between Bruce and me, except I'm probably about 35 pounds heavier than he is or something like that. So maybe you would distinguish. But, but Bruce and I, growing up, we were, we were identical. And so we were in third grade. We just moved into a new school system. We were in third grade. We were on the playground one day, and the teachers had said, okay, no tackle football allowed, all right? So Brian listened to the teachers and obeyed the teachers. My brother Bruce, on the other hand, if he's watching, Bruce, on the other hand, disobeyed the teachers and with a group of boys played tackle football, which was against the rules. All of a sudden, the teacher comes out, finds these, this group of boys disobeying the rules. All the boys scatter because they don't want to get in trouble. And the teacher, by memory, is going around trying to remember which boys had broken the rules so she could punish them. And the teacher comes to me and says, Brian, you were playing football. And I'm like, no, I wasn't. She said, I saw you, you were playing football. And I said, that was my twin brother. And she didn't know I had a twin brother. So she was like, oh yeah, I've heard that one before. Get up against the wall. And I had to stand with my nose against the wall the entire recess for something I didn't do. So what did I do on that day? I vicariously paid my brother's punishment. I what? I took his place. Now I have to admit that I vicariously took his place reluctantly. <laughs> I didn't do it willingly. And he still owes me, by the way. He's never paid me back for that. That was in third grade. Jesus, on the other hand, took your place willingly, not reluctantly. He didn't go to the cross kicking and screaming, saying, these aren't my sins, these are Brian's sins, or these are Vicky's sins, or these are Jose's sins. No, he willingly paid, he willingly died for our sins. You see, here's what Paul is saying. Jesus not only died, but Jesus died with a purpose. He died for your sins. He vicariously died for you. Vicki will remember this shortly after Justin, our oldest son, uh, gave his heart and life to Jesus and, and trusted Christ. Justin was praying one night, and he made a statement that when he first made it, it just didn't resonate well with me. He, he made this statement praying, as, I think it was four or five years old or something, and he made this statement. He said, Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I should have died on the cross. And I sat back and thought, wait a second, that's not historically possible. Jesus couldn't, or Justin couldn't literally have died on the cross. But then the Holy Spirit corrected my theology through the prayer of a five or six year old boy. Justin was simply saying this, Jesus, you died in my place. And he understood that truth as a little child. Jesus died for your sins. Isaiah says it this way in Isaiah 53, five, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Here's what I want us to do, because I want us to personally understand the significance of that verse. So I want to read that verse again. We'll put it up on the screen, and I want you to read it with me. And I want us to change once again the pronouns from plural to singular. Would you read this verse with me? but he was pierced for my transgressions. He was crushed for my iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought me peace. And with his wounds, I am healed. We tend to have a better view of ourselves than we should. When we think of that word sinners, for some reason, we tend to think of other people, do we not? But Jesus died for you because you are a sinner. 
Doesn't matter today if you've committed 500 sins or 5,000 sins or 500,000 sins. Your sins have offended a holy, righteous God. And you and I deserve to die for our sins. But Paul says, I got good news for you. Jesus died for your sins. And I hope you never get over that. I hope that just never becomes just a common fact that you can say without just a little bit of a quiver in your voice and without just a little bit of a broken heart, realizing that Jesus died for you. That's good news. Paul says a second thing in the passage. He says, Jesus was buried. 1 Corinthians 15, 4, that he was buried. I asked myself the question, why does Paul seem to emphasize Jesus' burial? Isn't that kind of like a a (laughs) no-brainer? Doesn't burial always follow death? And and I get in in this day and age, you know, some cremate, and so it might not be. But is Paul just stating the obvious, or is Paul making a theological point, saying that Jesus was buried? I believe that Paul is showing three actual truths, if not more. Let me mention them quickly. First of all, Paul is simply showing that Jesus really died. He really died. Some 19th century skeptics developed what was called the swoon theory. Not sure whether anybody's ever heard of that, but the swoon theory basically says that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He simply passed out on the cross. He simply swooned, and later on, he revived. So there was no actual death on his part. He simply passed out and later rose again. And Paul is demonstrating the fact that Jesus didn't pass out on the cross. Jesus died on the cross. He physically died, and his dead body was buried in a tomb. Paul is demonstrating the veracity of Jesus' death. You don't bury a living body. The second thing Paul is showing is this, is Jesus' burial depicts the depth of his suffering. To say that Jesus not only died, but was also buried in the grave means that he descended as low as he could go. He he suffered every aspect and every experience of death. Jesus endured not only the pain, not only the suffering and the curse of death, but he even experienced the terror of the grave so that he could save you and I from that same death from that same terror forever. But the third thing that Paul is illustrating, I think it might be the most significant, is the fact that Jesus' burial demonstrates our own death to sin and our own burial to sin. Let me show you what I mean. When when Bible teachers work out these parallels, they have little trouble showing how that we have been crucified with Christ, how we have been resurrected with Christ, as we're going to show here in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, how even one day we will ascend with Christ, the scripture says, but for some reason they have trouble with his burial as if his burial was simply an add-on, something that happened. What does his burial have to do with us? And Paul gives us a clue in his epistles. In Romans chapter 6 and verse 4, he says, We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might also walk in newness of life. Baptism beautifully depicts what Paul is talking about here. And you've seen us when we baptize, we often say, who's ever baptizing, the formula, they'll say, buried what? In the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. That's symbolic. But what does it show? It shows that when you and I give our hearts and lives to Jesus Christ, the old us, the old I, the old me, the old you, That was buried. And we have been raised to walk, as Paul says in Romans 6, 4, in newness of life. Here's what it means. It means the old Brian who demonstrated his temper on a regular basis, that old Brian was what? 
buried. The, the old you or the old somebody who, who struggled with thoughts, who struggled with attitudes, that old us was what? Was buried. The, the old us was buried with Christ, just as he was literally buried. So the old self was buried with him. And we have risen to walk in newness of life. Simple truth is this, that we don't have to live like the old us. So, so sometimes we use that as an excuse. Well, you know what? I know I got a hot temper. That's just the way God made me. Or I know I struggle with thoughts, but you know what? That's just the way, that's just the way I am. But God is saying, no, no, no. That old carnal you was buried. And if you continue to live that way, you know why you continue to live that way? Because you want to continue to live that way. You don't have to live that way. Christ buried that old you, and you actually, as we're going to see, can walk with resurrected power. Paul says, he was buried, verse 4, that he was buried, that he was raised from the dead in accordance with the scriptures. So Paul says, Jesus died for your sins, Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. Now once again, that news is not original with Paul. That news of Jesus' death, his vicarious death, his burial and his resurrection is referred to either directly or indirectly over and over again in the Old Testament. And Paul is simply declaring what the Old Testament had previously announced. I'm not going to put the verse up on the screen, but remember after Jesus' resurrection, he met two guys on the Emmaus Road. Remember that story there in Luke chapter 24? He met two guys on the Emmaus Road, and they were talking about everything that had happened. They didn't know that Jesus had rose from the dead yet, and Jesus kind of tags along with them, and they didn't know that the resurrected Lord was, was tagging along with them, and he listened to them, their conversation. They're trying to figure out what was taking place, and Luke tells us that Jesus then speak, and beginning with the Old Testament prophets and the Psalms, he taught them everything the Old Testament scripture said about what? About himself. About his death, about his burial, and about his resurrection. And then when he sat down to eat with them and he broke bread, they realized that it was none other than the resurrected Lord who was with them. Paul is simply saying, listen, Jesus died for your sins. He was buried and he rose again according to the scriptures. So can I give you good news today? You might have came to church saying, Brian, you know what? I really want some good news. Let me give you some good news today. Are you ready? Jesus died for your sins. Jesus was buried, and Jesus rose again. Man, that's better than a McRib sandwich, isn't it? It certainly is. That certainly is good news. But Paul shows us a second thing in this passage. He, he not only shows us that the good news is announced, but he shows us that the good news is received. In order to do that, let's jump back to the beginning of this chapter. We jumped over the first two verses, and I would like for us to look at these first two verses with a little bit of personal examination. And here's what I want you to ask yourself today as we read these verses, and the question is this, what is what was your response to the gospel? In other words, have you responded to the gospel with knowledge or have you responded to the gospel with faith? There's a difference. So notice verses one and two again. Paul says, now I would remind you, brothers and sisters of the gospel, I preached to you which you received and which you stand and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Man, there's a lot to unpack in those two verses. Let's first of all admit that the English sentence structure is just a little bit awkward. As we read through that, it's kind of like hit and miss. It's kind of like in this day and age, we don't do long sentences with come after come after come after come. And so this was written, it's a little bit of a, a long, awkward sentence. Let me read that in the New Living Translation just so we can wrap our minds a little bit easier around what he's saying. 
Paul says, let me remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then. You still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believed in something that was never true in the first place. In other words, unless, of course, you never truly believed. So here's what Paul does. Paul gives us a step-by-step guide as to how the gospel is personalized, how the gospel is transformed from a message that is heard to a message that is received. And I want you to do a little bit of self-examination today. Have you simply heard the gospel or have you truly received the gospel? Step by step, notice what Paul says. Paul says, first of all, the gospel is declared. The verb Paul uses when he says, I would remind you, brothers, or I preach the gospel I preach to you, is not the traditional Greek word for preaching, but rather a word that means to declare, a word that means to make known, or to make someone intimately aware of something. So rather than then, then Paul saying, okay, remember that sermon that I preached to you when I was there? Paul is kind of saying this. Remember the conversations we had when I simply shared with you the truth of the gospel? And, and we talked in such a way that you understood what I was saying. Paul is saying that this truth that I intimately declared to you. Do you remember today the first time you heard the gospel? Maybe it was a child in church. Maybe it was not long ago. But all of a sudden, the gospel was clearly articulated to you. The gospel was declared. Paul says, secondly, the gospel was not only declared, but the gospel was received. The word received here has the idea of welcoming and accepting it. Paul is saying that the Corinthians not only heard Paul's message, but they embraced it. They they admitted that what Paul was saying was true. All right, they, they understood what he was saying, and they personally accepted it. The third thing is the gospel is claimed. Notice Paul uses the phrase, in which you stand. In other words, he says, that gospel that I declared to you, the gospel that you received, the gospel in which you stand right now. The phrase in which you stand speaks of confidence, stability, firmness, and foundation. We sing that great hymn, on Christ the solid rock, I what? I stand All other ground is sinking sand. It's that firmness where we believe, we declare, we claim that the gospel is true. There's a fourth step. The gospel is activated. I love this. Notice in verse 4. And the ESV, I think, says it correctly. He says, by which you are being saved. And we would sit back and say, wait a second, Brian, hold on. Isn't salvation a a one-time act? And I would agree that it is, and we'll flesh that out in just a second. Because all of us can probably think back, maybe not all of us, but most of us can probably think back to that time that we would say that it was at that moment that I trusted Christ. Maybe you wrote it the date in your Bible. Maybe you remember it. And we say, wait a second, Brian, what do you mean? What does Paul mean when he says that gospel by which you are being saved? In a very real sense, Paul is saying that our salvation is a three-part act. The first act is this. We are saved. Past tense. What Jesus did in us, the moment we responded to him with repentance and faith. Do you remember that moment? I was a six-year-old boy. Never forget it. 1512, 25th Street, Canton, Ohio. In the living room of our home, knelt down on mom and, beside mom and dad's couch. I can still remember what the couch felt like. I still remember what it looks like. That moment 
when I ask Jesus to be my personal Savior. Paul says, you are saved. But secondly, he's not only talking about a past moment, but he's talking about a present moment. Because he not only says, he's not only meaning that we are saved, but he actually says, and I think the Greek actually says, that we are being saved. Not just something that happened in the past, but something that happens in the present. You say, Brian, what does that mean? It means what Jesus is doing in our lives every single day. You see, the gospel has the power to not just have this one-time momentary act in our lives, but the gospel has the power to change me every single day. And the gospel has the power, even though for me it's been 53 years since that moment when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ, the gospel is still alive and at work in my life. And I trust it's alive and at work in your life as well. There's a past aspect, there's a present aspect, and there's a future aspect. We are saved, or we are being saved, and we will be saved the culmination of our salvation. And quite frankly, that's what Paul fleshes out in this chapter where he talks about our eschatology, what is going to happen to us in the future. Paul says, the gospel is activated in our lives. Can I ask you a question for a second? And please, please, please just think about you. Don't think about the person beside you. Don't think about, I, I hope you're not thinking about the McRib because I don't even think they're serving it right now. So just put that out of your mind for just a second. But is the gospel active in your life today? At this moment, is the gospel, the fact that Jesus died for your sins, the fact that he was buried, the fact that he rose again, is it active in your life? I'm, I'm afraid that too many Christians today view their salvation as something that God did for them in the past. They made a decision five years ago, or they made a decision 10 years ago, or they made a decision 53 years ago. And we fail to realize that the gospel that saved us back then is the same gospel that transforms us today. That's what Paul says. The gospel is active in our lives. He mentions one final thing. He says the gospel secures. He says this, and by which you are being saved, if you hold fast the word I preach to you. And then he puts a caveat, unless, of course, you believed in vain. In other words, here's what Paul is saying. Catch this, catch this, catch this. The gospel finishes what it starts. Jesus finishes what he starts. The same gospel that saved you gives you the ability to persevere and it gives you the ability to hold fast. Paul says this in Philippians 1.6, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will finish it at the day of Jesus Christ. Remember what I said in the beginning of the message? I said it's so exciting for me to look out and see people in whom God is at work. Every single day, God the Father has given you and I, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of God, the all-powerful Holy Spirit of God who lives within us, who is given to us for the purpose of speaking to us, of guiding us, of directing us, of molding us, of shaping us into the image of Jesus Christ. He doesn't take a day off. He doesn't just work on Sundays when you're seated here. He works in our lives every single day. And he is molding us and shaping us into his image. You might sit back and say, man, Brian, I'm not sure that's a reality in my life. I'd encourage you to do one or two things. Actually, it's the same thing. 
But I'd encourage you to examine your life because if the Holy Spirit of God's in you and he's not actively changing you, then maybe there was never a true conversion in your life. Maybe you believed in vain. Maybe it was knowledge that you embraced and it wasn't faith that transformed you. Or just maybe he's at work and you're not listening to him. He's, desi he's desiring to mold you and shape you, but for some reason, it's like you have your fingers in your ears going, no, 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 no. And you don't hear what he is saying. At the beginning of the message, I asked you the question, how important is the resurrection to you? I didn't ask whether you believed in the resurrection, but how important is it? Uh, I have two cards here today. The first is Social Security card, and the second is my debit card. We have a tendency to view the resurrection as our Social Security card. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, all of us probably know our Social Security numbers, right? Probably you're thinking of it right now. You know your Social Security number. But our Social Security card is not something that we use on a regular basis, Right? As a matter of fact, I have to admit, this morning I told Vicki what I wanted to do, and I said, Vicki, do you have my Social Security card? She said, no, I don't think I do. Don't you have it? I said, no, I don't think I do. Can you go look? And she looked in all of our papers, and she couldn't find my Social Security card. So this isn't even my Social Security card. This is Amber's Social Security card. <laughs> all right? Our, our Social Security card is something that we know it's important, Right? And we know one of these days we're going to need it, right? But, but I don't need it every single day. I'm probably not going to need it until I retire. And when I retire, then I'm going to need it. So it's something that we know is important. I just don't use it every day. It's in a drawer somewhere. I don't pull it out. My debit card, on the other hand. And I'm covering up the number right there, all right? <laughs> My debit card, on the other hand, is something I use every single day. I draw from it. I need it. I depend on it. It provides for what we need. How important is the resurrection? You should back and say, I don't know, it's something I'm going to need in the future. I know that. I'm going to. But I got it stored away in my pocket or something until I need it. Or is it so important to you that every single day you draw from it? You depend on it. You know you can't be the husband you need to be without it. You know that you can't overcome sin without it. You realize that Jesus, through his death and his resurrection, has given you all the power that you need to live victoriously, and you draw from that every single day. Paul says this in Romans chapter 8 and verse 11, and I'm done. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Here's the point today. God desires for you to experience resurrection power every day. God desires for me to experience resurrection power every day. Does the resurrection matter? Yes. Absolutely. We're going to flesh out what Paul says in the coming weeks. Would you stand with me and pray with me today? Father, thank you so much that the tomb is empty. Thank you that Jesus fully overcame sin. He fully overcame death. He fully overcame the grave. He fully overcame sin for us. We're going to see that at the end of this chapter. Where Paul says, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to live in that power. Help us to live in that victory every day. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Come all you weary, come all you thirsty, come to the well that never runs dry. Drink of the water, come and thirst no more. Come all you sinners, come find his mercy. Come to the table, he will satisfy. Taste of his goodness, find what you're looking for. Let's sing it together. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us, whoever believes in him. We'll live forever, we'll live forever. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Let's sing. Bring all your failures, bring your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. See his open arms. For God so loved the world that he gave us, his one and only Son to save us. Whoever believes in him will live forever. Sing the power of hell forever defeated. It is well, I'm walking in freedom. For God so loved, God so loved the world. Sing praise God, praise God. From Amen. You may be seated for just a moment. We want to continue to thank each and every single one of you that give generously to God's kingdom work here at Hollywood Community Church. 
it is because of your faithfulness and your sacrifice that we're able to see lives connected to Jesus Christ, lives changed through him. And we have the honor and privilege to walk alongside each and every single one of you every single week and throughout the week because of your faithful obedience and sacrifice. So thank you for your generosity. We love each of you that are faithful in doing that. I'm going to pray these verses over us today. Would you bow your hearts with me today? Father, let your work be shown to your servants and your glorious power to their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Amen. Thank each of you for being here this morning. Remember, you are valuable, you matter, God loves you, and we love every single one of you. Have a great day. God bless you.